Steve, this can't be necessary, man. But to look at our military hall, we're having to go undercover. I just think I'm sure we've been followed. I keep getting letters all the time. I know, I know. And honestly, yeah, I now do believe I'm being followed. Are you sure it's not like a figment of your imagination? No, no, for sure. I mean, I know you're getting the letters, but you've got no evidence. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. Let's face facts, Mud Men is a worldwide hit with an unprecedented amount of adoring fans. Steve's fame has skyrocketed, and last week he was even mistaken for the bloke from Master Chef. But celebrity has come at a price. It appears Steve has a stalker. Honestly, he's got so bad, yeah? Yeah. Did, did you notice? What? I've changed the hairdo, just so I don't get recognised. Honestly. You've it's got, <laughs> yeah. It's got that bad. It really has got You've that bad. You've had to change your look. Listen, you said it all up. I'm going to go get Michael, right? I think I have to get Michael because I've got, I've got. Why, why can't you set up and I go and get Michael? Because that way you're exposed. You. I never thought that. You go and get Michael. I go and get Michael, yeah. I need to bring Dr. Michael Lewis from the British Museum to our top secret location. He's the deputy head of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, and he needs to record our finds. But what he doesn't know is that he's about to do it now. Where's about turn, soldier. It's fine time. Oh, oh okay. let's get out of here. It's a bad area. Give it the flat knacker, drives. Head down. Head down. Head down, Michael. We're not going to make it. What? True, hey, true, true, true. We're here. So we're where, here. where have you brought me to this time? It's oh. a secret location. I'm under threat. What? Hey, I you don't believe you... it. Well, I was until Johnny picked me up. I mean, where where are these all come from? Chatham Foreshore. Chatham Foreshore we went down to. It was oh, absolutely right. brilliant. Really was. So we got a table full of military stuff. Well, we've got lots of stuff, haven't we, really? Get a lot of that. Now, Shrapnel. Yeah, mm. mainly on land we get a lot. Funny enough, yeah, you don't get a lot on the foreshore. Oh, due to the fact that, you know, I think it's so muddy that as this stuff rained down on us, yeah. it just went straight into the mud. Yeah, did on it the rain down on us? Yeah, it did. This is why, you know, you had to be... You'd have the warden come round telling you to get in. It's because this would be coming down. This, uh, hit, imagine that hitting you on your head. I don't want it. It'd kill you. Yeah. And that's why you have to go indoors. There's another bit there, isn't there? Yeah, another bit there. That's got numbers on it, that has. Well, this and is... And it says safe. I right. think that's a bit of fuse casing, actually, that, isn't it? Yeah, anti-aircraft bomb. So as this thing goes up, yeah, at a certain 10,000 feet, yeah, this explodes. These would be filled, yeah, with ball bearings. OK. And so on the foreshore or anywhere, sometimes, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, it's a musket ball. Yeah. In fact, yeah, look, we've got a musket ball there. Yeah, there's another one here. Yeah, check that one out. But these things, yeah, were packed in here. It explode everywhere, yeah? Any planes, any German planes going by, hopefully it would get hit by one of these or, of course, the shrapnel. You've got some, a bit of grenade here as well, actually. That's yeah. nice, isn't it? And how many of these have I found on the foreshore? Hundreds. 180. You found 180 grenades? Yeah. You have found one that's live and ready to go, good to go? Yeah, all the ones I've found have been live. Have they? Yeah. But I don't, I don't understand that. How come there are grenades on the foreshore? Why would a grenade end up on a foreshore? I don't get it. Because uh, at the end of the war, people had loads of bits and pieces they wanted to get rid of. By throwing them into the Thames, is a yeah. good way of getting rid of them. Why don't they let them off? Well, so you'd be down the local chippy with a grenade and you just you know, pull out the ring. No, but I'm saying what manner of man has a grenade in his hands and thinks, I'll just toss this into the Thames hole. Anyone's going to pull the pin out and sling it in, just for a laugh. I'm just saying you're going to, though. <laughs> Michael, this is a really good find. I like this, yeah? Because he wouldn't be in it. So check yeah. out what it says in there. He definitely wouldn't be in there. <clears throat> oh, yeah, the intelligence call. That's nice, isn't it? It's a little kind oh, of cap really cool. button, isn't it? So that's the intelligence call, which obviously became... Did that become all the MIs, like MI5 and 6 and these? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, that's the kind of the later kind of where it led to, I suppose. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is yeah. he's lost his badge. How intelligent could he be? Yeah, he wasn't that great, was he? Also, these were quite nice. And a matching pair as well. Cut the buttons. Oh, yeah. Cut the military buttons. Oh, and they've got the kind of the royal arms on. What do they say? Des droits. Dieu et mon droit. That's it. That's what I was looking for. God no. on my right. So, the table. Yeah. Extremely well, military. But we want to know, is it one or is it two? Well, it came from Richard. It was from a camping shop. Oh, what's on the table? Yes. yes. What does it say to you, Michael? Well, it's definitely military. There's loads of military stuff here. I mean, it'd be really great to find out about World War I since we've got all of these objects, perhaps, from the Great War. So find out a little bit more about those. But then also, it'd be really nice to find out about life as a soldier in World War I. That's the challenge. Thank you very much, Michael. I no think problems. you can find your own way back. Well, I don't know if Go I can, Go through the really. hedges, you get to the railway tracks, Go under the tracks, through there, 
go over the motorway fast. Keep your head down, just go fast, fast, yeah? And there's a motorway services. I'll put your cabinets there. So it's that way, is it? No, it's back through oh, there. Okay. All right, but cheers. you really get your head down. When you go over that motorway, yeah, you run. You run. Okay. See you later. See you later. Great, thanks. Cheers, Mike. Right, let's pack it up, Steve. The Great War it is. Let's do it. Coming up, our World War I mission sends us into training. Stand up, you lazy little monkey! Get up! Our military finds from the foreshore near the historic naval dockyard in Chatham, Kent, have sent us off on a World War I-related mission. That's a general service button. I think they crossed over First and Second World War. To find out more about these finds, we've come to the National Army Museum in London, where friend of the show, Julian Farrance, will hopefully be able to tell us whether they actually came from the Great War. Hi, Julian. Lads. Good to see you again. Thank you. Hi, Julian. How are you, mate? I'm well, thank you. Nice to see you. I'm Johnny. This is Steve. <laughs> I do remember. Julian, tell who, us about this who is he? Who is he? <laughs> Well, this is a representation of a typical soldier of the Great War. There we are. So he's about 1915, 1916. Steve found these on the foreshore at Chatham, and we'd just like to uh, know if they're First World War or not. Oh, they very easily could be. Ooh! Ooh. Uh -huh. What these are are what's called GS, or General Service, buttons. And if yes. you look at this guy's tunic here, what you've got... Is it's standard, an exact match! Standard We're tunic. in! We are in there! Yeah, and what it's... Tells, what, what are the characteristics of the button, well, apart from the size? It's got the royal arms on it there, and if you look at the top, it's got a king's crown on it instead of a queen's crown. If it was a queen's okay. crown button, it would have been a Victorian button. Yes. So this is post-Victoria, and they could easily have come from the First World War. Next Excellent! On, yeah, really good. Next on the menu, yep. this came up. Now, I know a tiny bit about it. But oh. is it either cat badge, which I think it may be too small, or would it be a lapel badge or something? Well, now, you see, you're showing your knowledge there, aren't you? Because that is an intelligence core badge. But it, as you say, look, here's one, I, here's one I prepared earlier, because that's an intelligence core. That's a cat badge, and you can see it's much bigger. Yeah, yeah. Now, that sort of size could be a beret badge, but because it's just intelligence core, not royal intelligence core, it makes me think that it's more likely, as you say, an officer's collar dog. So that's, that's, that's a forerunner to, like, MI6. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Um, but we still have military intelligence today for yes. intelligences, uh, battlefield intelligence, like signals and that sort of thing. Okay. So that's what they are, rather than the sort of cloak and dagger Jim Bond kind of stuff. Well, yeah, if it's cloak and dagger, you wouldn't have a badge. So how big was the army at the start of the war? It's much smaller than you actually might have thought it was. Um, at the end of the war, we're talking about millions of soldiers. For the British army at the beginning of the war, 100,000, not very many. And it's a very professional, very well-trained army. But after the initial battles, it's getting hammered, so we need... More guys, and a lot more of them, as many as we can get. Now, you see recruitment, I, I don't want to go. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely want to go. Knowing now what yeah. I know, I don't want to go. Yeah. No, no. So how do you get me in there? Well, you, because you don't know. That's the initial thing, is people don't know what they're going to get. They don't, they don't know what to expect. There are guys joining up purely because it's a solid job. You're going to get paid, you're going to get fed, you're going to get clothed. Yeah. So guys go and join up for those kind of reasons as well. How can they ensure they're getting the right sort of recruits? Uh, and, and what's the sort of average age of them now? Well, the average age is about 29, which is surprising to a lot of people. Yes. Because they think it's always going to be a lot younger than that. But the Army's, in theory at least, quite careful about the age that they will recruit at. You're not supposed to go off and fight unless you're at least 19. What were the entry requirements then, apart from age then? Well, the, the only entry requirement they're looking at is height. You've got to be over a certain height. In 1914, you've got to be over 5 foot 9 to be able to get, it, get in. Um, and that's actually, in 1914, 5 foot 9, pretty tall. But is that five foot nine before or after you join? Because didn't you grow two inches? That's not true. It that is, is not true. it is. Sorry, we've argued about this on the way here. I don't believe that's it's true. It's true. Sorry, Johnny, you're out of luck there. It is actually true. No. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the instances, recruits not only put on weight because they join the army and they're getting yeah. much better fed, but because of the amount of exercise that they're getting, they're getting a healthy lifestyle out in the fresh air. There are plenty of recorded instances of guys growing a couple of inches in height as well. Um, did, the, did the requirements come down then as, as they, they needed more bodies and yeah. effectively cannon fodder? Very quickly, the, the, the height requirement starts to drop. And by Christmas, you're talking about guys being let in at five foot one. And even if you're shorter than five foot one, you can still get in because you can join what's called a Bantam Battalion, which is a regiment for little guys. No! No! Persons of restricted growth? That's exactly it. What do they do? Do they have a specialist job? No, nope. they are just basically line infantry guys. They're used in the same way that everybody else is. Um, bizarrely, the, the Germans seem to like capturing them quite a lot. So wherever the Bantams oh. are deployed, the Germans try and What do they do? The with novelty. Them? I don't know. And who wouldn't want it? Who wouldn't want a whole regiment of the Whittle guys? 
All right, so yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah. What happens to me first? Well, you're going to have to get trained, obviously. So you'd be you report to your, your train depot, wherever that might be. Uh, and obviously, we're talking about a, a national interest. So it's not that you're just going to go to one training depot. They're all over the place. An individual soldier would get up to three months of training on musketry, square bashing, all of the useful things that you're going to need. Mm. So the training is pretty comprehensive. British soldiers, always the best equipped, best trained, usually the smallest forces that you'll ever find in any of the wars that we study. Julian, as per normal, that was brilliant. Thanks for having us again. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, Julian. Wonderful to talk to you. And we'll see you again uh, maybe later on this series, maybe the next one, because we love you. Thanks, guys. See you later. Cheers. Cheers. I hate those guys. <laughs>